Okay, no questions. Uh, then let's just continue here. Uh, what is the metric unit of length? I think that's a meter, the meter. A kilobuck, uh, a kilobuck, a kilo is a thousand, so a thousand, mega is a million. So. One milliliter is equal to how many exactly? Uh, exactly uh, a thousand milliliters in, the, in a liter. So one milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter. It's in different ways. A milli is um, 10 to the minus three. And so we could do that here um, if we want to go the other way. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Hopefully, shoot, what number was that? Thirties, I think it was in the thirties. Yeah. So um, we could use that uh, as just a substitution. So if you see little m here, you know, little m, maybe I need to narrow down the pen. Let me do that. Um, little m is 10 to the minus 3, and then micro is 10 to the minus 6. And then um, what comes after micro? Nano is 10 to the minus 9. Yeah. Pico is 10 to the minus 12. Kilo is 10 to the third. Mega is 10 to the sixth. Giga is 10 to the ninth. Terra is 10 to the 12. And so if we have a, um, let's say if we had one gigabyte, um, uh, byte, I don't know, what is the BY? If we have one gigabyte, uh, then it's 10 to the ninth bytes. We just replace giga with 10 to the ninth. We could do that for these types of things. So this is what they did here. They just replaced milli with 10 to the minus three. But they did it in decimal form rather than ex exponent type scientific notation form. Uh, which unit, megagrams or grams, are most suitable for expressing the mass of an automobile? I'd say megagrams, um, because then we wouldn't have to use scientific notation, most likely. Because the gram's too small. 5.74 centigrams. Centigram is not that common. Centimeters is common. So there's 100 centimeters in a meter, so there must be 100 centigrams in a gram. So this is just dimensional analysis. Five, oops, I can do it this way. <clears throat> 5.74 centigrams. And then there must be 100 centigrams per gram. Okay. And so we're dividing it. And so what does that come out to? 0. 0.0574 grams. This one would be more convenient in milligrams. In milli, we just move it three decimals. So this would be 57.4 milligrams. I don't know why they use centigrams for that. Centigram is a very odd unit. I would have skipped this problem myself. Um, kilograms to grams, that's easy. Once you do a bunch of these, then you can just do it, you know, um, grams are smaller, so we're gonna make it bigger. Bigger number of grams, smaller number of kilograms. So we move it three over. So move it one, two, three, 1,410 grams. 1,410, or to keep it three sig figs unambiguous, you, you got 1.41 times 10 to the third. Uh, centigrams to milligrams, I'm gonna skip that. Centigrams, <clears throat> although our balances, our balances are called centigram balances. The reason our balances are called centigram balances is because they measure to the nearest centigram. And that's the second decimal. So our balances measure two decimal places. Milligram balances measure three decimal places, and tenth of milligram balances measure four decimal places. Meters to centimeters, that's easy. They're more um, centimeters, centimeters smaller, so 100 more. So let's move the decimal two over here. Scientific notation, I would have just written in decimal form. 
kilometers are bigger, so this we're going to make it smaller. So we'll move it three over 0.517. Centimeters are, are smaller, so we got to make it bigger. Okay, so kilometers, meters, we move it three, and the meters to centimeters, we move it two. So we got to move it five over. So we got to add two zeros to the end there. And we'll move it five over. And this, this is a scientific notation. Um, cubic centimeters, milliliters. Cubic centimeter, milliliters, same thing. 94. Liters to milliliters. Milliliters is smaller, so we've got to make this bigger by three. We're moving it three over 1,910. Cubic centimeters is smaller, so we're going to make the number smaller by three decimal places, 0 0.874 liters. Hectogram, uh, forget that. That's not one I asked you to memorize. Meters to picometers. Picometers, 10 to the minus 12. This one, I don't want to move the decimal because I can move it a whole bunch of times. This one, I'm going to use a conversion factor to do. When it's a simple one, it's, it's easier to do, just move the decimal. But when it's more complicated, we got to go, I go meters to picometers. And going meters to picometers, there's two conversion factors that we can use for that particular one. Uh, let's do it like this. And so we could say in, in one meter, there is um, well, a pico, pico is 10 to the minus 12. And so we could say in one meter, there's one trillion or 10 to the 12 picometers. And so picometer is smaller, we need a big number of those. Or we could say in one picometer, there is 10 to the minus 12 meters. So 10 to the minus 12 is a pico. And so this is 10 to the minus 12 is P, PM is PM. This is different. This is usually the way I do it. I don't, I don't substitute these, but it doesn't matter. Let's see the way the book did it. Um, the way the book does it is, which oh, they didn't show the conversion. They just went ahead. Um, I would have done this by a dimensional analysis probably, or <clears throat> By dimensional analysis, I wouldn't have done it like this. Myself, I would have set it up like this. Let's try to get this here. I would have gone 5.27 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. And then um, I, I would just have these kind of things memorized. 10 to the 12th or trillion picometers in one meter. Picometers. So if you take a meter and divide it into a trillion pieces, each of those pieces is a picometer. So um, 10 to the minus 7 times 10 to the 12 is 10 to the positive 5. So we get 10 to the positive 5 here. Um, grams to DAG. A DAG is not common. It's not one of the ones I ask you to memorize. So let's skip that. The ones I asked you to memorize are on that um, in the PowerPoint. These are volume measurements. We actually, we did all these volume measurements. It's practice. These are sig fig problems. And so you just do quick check three sig figs, five sig figs, you know, quick check three sig figs. This one's ambiguous. This one's going to be two or five. Two or five. They're probably going to say two, but it's uncertain. Two to five. It depends on 48,000. Did you actually measure that precisely? Or is that a rough approximation? No. It's two, et cetera. So we can just do quick sig figs check. And then um, round uh, off each quantity to three sig figs. So we're dropping the eight, we round up 6.40, do a check there. This is already three sig figs. This would be 7.90 times 10 to the fifth. No, we could just check that. Um, to three sig figs, that would be um, 42,200 tons of fertilizer. 1,200. Three sig figs, $650. We do those quick checks in there. Okay, let's look at these here. A moving van crew picks up the following items. A couch that weighs 147 pounds a chair that weighs 67.7 pounds, a piano at 3.6 times 10 squared pounds, and several boxes having a total weight of 140 
35.43 pounds. Calculate and express the correct number of sig figs of the total weight of the load. Okay, this one we have to get everything in decimal form or everything in, uh, to the same exponent. And so you have two choices. When we're dealing with scientific notation, we always got to make sure everything's times 10 squared, times 10 squared, times 10 squared. That way we can see how the decimal point lines up. That's a hassle. I don't want to write everything in terms of 10 squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert this scientific into um, decimal form. And then we'll just add them up. So um, let's see. I don't think they did that. Let me see if they did that. They did that, but um, no, they didn't do that. They didn't do that. That's not, they probably didn't do it because they didn't have room. But we can't leave this here like that. It's all, all got to be 10 squared across the row, or it's all got to be decimal form. And so it's going to be easier to do a decimal because most of these are decimal. So 147 plus 67.7 plus 360. Okay, but that's to two sig figs. So this is to two sig figs plus 135.43. So there are a whole bunch of different um, precisions here. And so when we look at the uncertain digit, um, let's just mark those in red. We're only allowed one uncertain digit. So it's the last digit here. It's the seven. It's this digit here. It's going to be this digit here or this digit here. This zero is not significant because they're telling us it's not significant here. And so that means we're going to have uncertainty in this place here. So um, let's just add it up here. It's going to come out to 147 plus 67.7 plus 360 plus 135.43. And uh, that's going to give me 710.13 pounds. So, oops. Not red. So this gives me 710.13 pounds. We need the units there. I didn't write the units here. Well, I'll just write it here. Okay, now we got to carry down the uncertainty. Um, when we carry down the uncertainty, each, if this is uncertain, it's going to mark this one as uncertain. And so this is uncertain because of this digit here. This is gonna be uncertain because of that seven there. This is uncertain here. This is uncertain. We're only allowed one uncertain digit. And so we have to drop these other three. And so the final answer is gonna be 710 pounds. 710 pounds like that. And that shows one uncertain digit. Let's move on here. A burette contains 22.93 milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution. Um, do you recall what a burette looks like? A few minutes later, the volume is down to 19.4 milliliters because of a small leak. How many milliliters of solution have drained from the burette? And so in, in this, um, the burette, there's a little valve at the bottom. And so here, let's say, oh, let's do more red. Say here in the beer we started at 22.93 milliliters. That's where the water, and then it drops to 19.4. This is wrong. The beer reads to two decimal places always. So this is this is incorrect. It should have been 19.40. Burettes are always going to read to two decimal places like this. And so this is screwed up. Milliliters here. All right, now when we subtract these two, unless, you know, with a burette, if they, if they, if they really mean 19.4, then they misread it. That's, that's called user error. That's called poor lab technique. If they really read this at 19.4, then, you know, you know how much a burette costs? That, that long tube with a little valve at the bottom? That burette costs $200. And the reason is, is because you want this kind of precision. Now, if somebody's writing 19.4 milliliters, then they're wasting $200. You don't need a $200 barrette to give you one decimal place of precision. You can do that with a grad. 
cylinder or something else less expensive and not risk breaking this every well almost no nah, no nah. once in a while somebody breaks this and has to shell out two hundred dollars to replace it in the lab but anyway yeah yeah they're not happy um, trust me and um and if they could have used something cheaper then they should have used it uh, so we got to take the difference here, you know. So if we start at 22.93 and we end up at 19.4, then let's subtract those. That's going to be three. That's going to be a five. And then we're going to get three, 3.53 3 milliliters. They must have drained. They must have lost 3.53 3 milliliters, which is the difference there because um, it started to leak out. Um, but this this is not a realistic problem. I wish they didn't do this. You'd never ever do this with a burette ever. This problem is totally unrealistic. So anyway, let's move on. I don't like that problem. The mole is the SI unit for the amount of sub substance. Okay, so this is a kind of a new unit. And SI, what does SI stand for again? Yeah, good. good. All right, there are two ways we could do it. You know, if one mole is 342.3, then a half mole has got to be half of that. So you could just do this in your head or, you know, use a calculator, take half of that. Or we could use dimensional analysis. So in this case, I probably would just do this in my head. You know, what's half of 342.3 because I have half a mole. So one mole weighs this much or is this much. But this is about three quarters. It's not exactly three quarters. And so this one for sure I would do using dimensional analysis. This one I might not do to using dimensional analysis. I might just um, go ahead and calculate it. And, but um, let's, let's take a look at this. If I have point, okay, here's where we got to get into this, you know, composite unit. This is 0.764 moles. Moles we're going to get more familiar with as we go along, but don't worry about it right now. You, or you might already know what a mole is, but, but what we have to do is we have to say it's a mole, moles of sugar. Um, because moles are generic. They could be for anything. They could be for light bulbs. If you have a mole of light bulbs, or you could have a mole of sugar molecules. This is a mole of sugar molecules. And so we're going to just say, you can put molecules in here as well. If you want to be even more descriptive. And then there's going to be three. This is only good for sugar. There's 342.3 grams of sugar for every one mole of sugar molecules. And so the moles of sugar cancel the moles of sugar and gives us grams of sugar. And that's what we want, um, how many grams. And we just punch it in the calculator. Here, they're going to do the same thing. They're not going to show us the rounding step because whoever did this doesn't do it. Here they use dimensional analysis for the half mole as well, which is fine. Here. Half mole is um, exact, they said. And so this would be four sig figs. 0.764 is three sig figs. That's four sig figs, so we're allowed three sig figs. But I want to see the rounding step, so I'm going to calculate 0.764 times 342.3. 261.51. And so my answer I calculate is 261.51 grams of sugar. And I see I'm allowed three sig figs, so I'm going to round that to 262 grams of sugar. So again, I want to see that rounding step. Okay, let's move on. Here, an empty beaker with a mass of 42.3 grams is filled with liquid, and the resulting mass of the liquid in the beaker is 62.87 grams. The volume of the liquid is 19 point, no, excuse me, 19 milliliters. What is the density of the liquid? So in, in, in this case, this is kind of an algebra style problem because we have to know what, what is the density? The density is a mass to volume ratio. And so if I want the density, there are different symbols for density. One is little d, or two is big D. 
and it's just going to be the mass. This is going to be the mass of the liquid. We want the density of the liquid, liquid divided by the volume of the liquid. The volume we use V for volume. So that's so mass of the liquid divided by the volume of the liquid. The mass of the liquid, um, what is it? Forty mass. An empty beaker with a mass of 42.3. So well, what a beaker looks like is, is this little cup like this. And it's empty. There's nothing in the beaker. So this is just the beaker alone. The beaker alone is 42.3 grams. And then they put some liquid in that beaker. Well, yeah, you need a container to, to weigh, the, um, weigh the liquid in there. So we add some liquid in there into this beaker. So, and then reweigh it. And so when we reweigh it, it weighs 62.87 grams. What are they doing? This is unrealistic. If we're using a centigram balance, then we're missing a digit here. This should be 42.30. Why are they dropping the zero? I don't know. Centigram balance is about 200 bucks. If we only need 10th of a gram precision, then we could use something cheaper. And so how much liquid do we have in there? Well, this is what we say beaker plus liquid. This is beaker alone. So if we take beaker plus liquid minus the beaker, then we get the liquid alone. So what is the liquid alone? So 62.87 minus 42.30. 62.87 minus 42.30 gives me 20.57. So the difference is 20.57 grams of liquid. So I must add a 20.57. And so the mass of the liquid is 20.57. This is algebra because I have the algebraic equation here. And the volume of the liquid is 19 milliliters. So we've got 20.57 divided by 19 is gonna give me 1.0826, et cetera, et cetera, grams per milliliter. That's the units, grams per milliliter. I'm allowed how many sig figs? It looks like I'm only allowed two sig figs, 19. If I'm only allowed two sig figs, I'm going to have to round that to 1.1 grams per milliliter. Here. So it should be 1.1 grams per milliliter. Let's see what they got. Here. Um, which they got, 1.1. So they got the... Um, grams of liquid on the top of uh, volume. Here we go. The so gallons to cubic centimeter conversion. This, this type of gallons to cubic centimeter, we don't have to use the, you know, cubing and all that other stuff. This one we should be able to do with ones that we know you know, ones that we know, what conversion factors do you need to know? You need to know all the ones that you learned in elementary school, plus some others. And so conversion factors that are very useful to memorize are, are these. And um, let me write some of those down. Um, we know uh, this one, 1 inch is 2.54 centimeters exactly. So I'm gonna write three bars there. And then uh, uh, others that are very useful, one gallon is equal to 3.785 liters. This is four sig figs here. That's very useful to know. What's another um, very useful one to know? And um, that is um, one pound is 453.6 grams. This is four sig figs. 
equals. So we could get these to exact, but for most of our calculation, four sig figs is adequate. Like this calculation, we're given three sig figs. So using four sig figs is fine. And so we go 0.715. Let's just do this really quick because we wanted to see. 0.715, we got to get rid of gallons. So what gets rid of gallons? Well, um, we could go gallons to liters here, or gallons to quarts, or we could go to gallons to whatever. But it's liter sounds um, reasonable. So 3.785 liters for one gallon. This is four sig figs, this is three sig figs. That's good. And then we can go liters to milliliters, you know, thousand milliliters in one liter. Uh, the reason I want to go to milliliters is because a cubic centimeter and milliliter are the same thing. So one cubic centimeter is the same thing as one milliliter. That takes us there. Let's stick out there. We can go from milliliters to gallons. So there are other strategies we can do. Well, we can go from milliliters to liters and then liters to gallons. This is another strategy you can use in dimensional analysis. Milliliters to liters is 1,000 milliliters in a liter, or liters, 1,000 milliliters, and then liters to gallons, 3.75 liters to a gallon. So we can use those to figure it out as well. So here they're going gallons to liters. We use 3.75, and then liters to cubic centimeters. And then cubic centimeters is the same thing as milliliters, so they didn't even bother showing it. Oh, actually, we need to stop at cubic centimeters. Um, they did this, you know, used it interchangeably. I don't do that. I just, um, I did milliliters and then the conversion here. I don't want too many variations of the same. Okay, for the bottom one, we want milliliters to liters, liters to gallons. So that's it. That's the path you take through the jungle. Pro popular breakfast cereal comes in a box, actually. Maybe I didn't want to show the answer just yet. Uh, containing 515 grams. How many pounds is this? So we can just go straight from um, pounds, uh, grams to pounds here using this. Doing, except these five sig figs here. How many sig figs should you use? How many sig figs you should use is at least one more or the same amount. You know, the more the better, but once you start adding more and more, it's not going to make any difference because you get around anyway. And so here, ideally, we want at least one more. So if I have three sig figs in my given, I want four sig figs here. And so I'd use this one. Using five sig figs, yeah, they're going to have less roundoff error. But the difference between five sig figs and six sig figs is negligible. It's not going to be worth it, you know, because you already have enough. So going one or two sig figs extra is good. But this number is harder to memorize. This number is easier to memorize. This one too. We want to be consistent. Again, they didn't show me the rounding step here. The payload of a small pickup truck is 1,450 pounds. Assume three sig figs. What is this in kilograms? So this one, I would, you know, I don't want to memorize a whole bunch of conversion factors. There's a conversion factor for pounds to kilograms. I actually know it. I haven't memorized, but I want to minimize memorization. And, I, uh, and that's going to require extra steps sometimes, but it means less memorization. And so what I would do is I go 450 pounds to grams. And so 453.6 grams per pound of anything. This is truck. I could write pickup truck here, pickup truck. but And for advanced problems, I'd have to write it pounds of pickup truck, because this is generic. This is for anything. Um, for advanced problems, I'd have to write it, but for this one, I'm not. And then pounds to grams, and then grams to kilograms. That's the way I do it. And so um, um, 1,000 grams is equivalent to a kilogram. So we can just check that real quick here. Check out pounds to grams, grams to kilograms. Uh, there is 115 milligrams of calcium in a 100 gram serving of whole milk. How many grams of calcium is this? Okay, now we're getting into a more advanced 
um, style of problem. This more advanced style of problem means that we have to be very, um, very particular about how we label things. Um, so for example, here, should I, should I write down, okay, I'm given 115 milligrams of calcium um, in 100 grams serving whole milk. Oh, how many grams? I don't have to do that, I guess. How soon is that? Well, this one, actually, I don't have to do it quite yet. But um, I, was I was hoping this one would be a more advanced problem, but it turns out it isn't. And the reason you have to be specific is there's a mass of calcium and a mass of milk. So you gotta be careful what mass are you talking about? So if somebody wrote 115 milligrams, are you talking about milk or are you talking about calcium? This is where a lot of people get the wrong answer is they just write 115 milligrams and they just say, oh, that's milk. Yeah, or that's calcium, depending on what they want, you know, at the time and they screwed up. This one turned out not to be an advanced problem because this one is, um, Uh, let me see. This one is, um, they're only asking about the calcium here. So uh, 115 milligrams is, um, how many grams is that? Well, 115 milligrams, a gram is three orders bigger. So this is 0.115 grams. Um, the way, eventually what you could do is you could do something like this. If you have 0.115 grams, then to convert that to milligrams, we move it three over. So that's 115 milligrams. To convert it into micrograms, we move it six over. So we move it six over, that's 115,000 micrograms. To move it to nanograms, that's nine over. So that's gonna be 115, we move it nine over. So that's three, six, nine. This would be how many nanograms, which would be 115 million nanograms. So we could do it like that, or we could just use dimensional analysis to do it. And using dimensional analysis to do it, um, you know, you, you could do it two ways, 115 milligrams. I do it this way. I always do it like this, um, 1,000 milligrams per gram. I, I, and I stick with it. I, I pick one way and always do it the same way each time. I don't like to mix it up. So I wouldn't like to mix it up like doing this 115 milligrams. Well, there are 10 to the minus three milli, um, 10 to the minus three, oh, sorry, 10 to the minus three grams up here per one milligram down there. Let's see. Per milligram. So one milligram is 10 to the minus three grams. So I, I don't, I, preferentially I don't do it this way. I do it this way. So I stick with it. Let's see what the book did. The book did it the way I do it. Here. Converted to grams and then we can go grams to pounds. When we do that, we don't want to do intermediate round offs, no. which means sometimes you just redo the calculation from the beginning. Again, they're using five sig figs. I don't know why they're using five sig figs here. An Australian boxer reads 69.1 kilograms when he steps on the balance scale in the gymnasium. Should he be classified as a welterweight or a middleweight? And so, well, we've got to figure out how many pounds that is. And so we could go straight from kilograms to pounds, but I don't want to memorize that. I'm going to go round about way. Round about way I do it would be 69.1 kilograms and then go to grams. And, you know, we know that 453.6 grams in a kilogram and then go to pounds. There are, oops, um, Sorry, there are 1,000 grams per kilogram and then um, 453.6 grams in a pound. So we can do it that way. Let's see what's booked in. A kilograms to grams, grams to pounds. 
152 pounds, which puts them at middle weight. The height of Angel Falls in Venezuela is 979 meters. How high is this in yards? So I don't look for meters to yards. I go from meters. This is the way I do it. Well, let's see what the way I've booked it. In. Meters to centimeters, centimeters to inches, inches to feet, feet to yard. That's the best. That's the best way to do that. I don't know what they're doing here. I just ignore that here. These are all ones that you should know. You know, what some people do is this. <clears throat> I've seen this on the tests. I've seen people say, well, if it's 979 meters, then, um, and then a meter is about a yard. So they say, well, one yard is about one meter. And so they say there's 979 yards. I've seen that. Or they say this, you know, there's about three feet in a meter. They learned that. They learned there's about one yard in a meter and about three feet in a meter. And so divided by three. The problem with this is um, how many sig figs is that good to? You know, one meter is not exactly one yard. This is only good to one sig fig. This one, this one's only good to one sig fig. That's not good. Whereas this one, this is infinite, this is infinite, this is infinite, this is infinite. And so doing this, we're all using all exact conversion factors. Doing this, this is approximation. You know, there's about one yard in a meter. So the meter stick is about the same length as a yard stick. But you're adding, if you want to do a quick calculation, yeah, go ahead and do it. You know. but, um, you know. The Willis Tower in Chicago is 1,451 feet. Feet to meters, okay. We already did something like that, so just skip it. You know. The summit of, or we could just look quickly. Feet to inches, this is exact. Inches to centimeters, this is exact. Centimeters to meters, that's exact. That's good, they're using exact conversion factors to do this, I get that. Um, summit of Everest is 29,000 feet, it's for in kilometers. Let's see what they did. They went from feet to inches, exact. Inches to centimeters, exact. Centimeters to meters, exact. Meters to kilometers, exact. That's good. We got the kilometers there. An office building is heated by oil-fired burners. Just 619 gallon storage tank. Well, that's three sig figs. Calculate the tank and volume in liters. So we'll, here we'll, we can go from gallons to liters. 3.785, that's four sig figs. This is three sig figs, that's four sig figs. We're allowed three sig figs here. That's good, 3.785. Um, these are temp temperature conversions, so we just plug and chug in the um, equation. You know, you either memorize it or derive it. You know, we already did that. So 69 Celsius, um, that's pretty hot in Fahrenheit, 156 Fahrenheit. Kelvin, 342. You can just do your calculation. Do a few of these, make sure you can do those right. Normal body temperature is 98.6 Fahrenheit. What is this in Celsius? And so here, um, here we got to rearrange our equation. And so um, rearranging, rearranging the equation is not, um, not too bad. And so our equation, either you memorize it or derive it. And so I rearrange it. And so I'm solving for degree C. So degree C, oops. Degree C is equal to, um, well, degrees Fahrenheit, right? Minus 32 degrees times five ninths. And so this is the way I do it. Five ninths, and then let's plug it in. So it's gonna be, I don't know, let's see what it is. Actually, we can guess or estimate it too, of course. 37.0 Celsius. 
Energy conservationists suggest that air conditioners should be set so that they do not turn on until the temperature drop top 78 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the Celsius temperature of this? And so we already did this once. I think we can handle it several times. World's highest shade temperature is 58 Celsius. Wow. How hot is that? Uh, I don't know. 58 Celsius. I know Fahrenheit. But how hot is that? 136 Fahrenheit. That's an insane. I would not want to be there when the temperature is that hot. I have a hard enough time when it hits 90. <laughs> um, okay, this, we did one example of this. Do you remember what example we did of this? Graphing? It was deriving the equation. What equation was it that we were deriving that we used the graphing? Yeah, y equals mx plus b. But what did we, what would the equation have that form y equals mx plus b? Just did it. We, we already did this. Um, the y equals x, we were talking about that. Fahrenheit to Celsius, that's right or Celsius to Fahrenheit, right? That's correct, temperature. So we did that. We could do the exact same thing for Kelvin. Um, for Kelvin, we would have gotten, you know, we can get, we can derive the equation for Celsius to um, Kelvin. This is the scientific method. This is what scientists do. Um, so let's talk about deriving the degree Celsius and Kelvin relationship. First, we wanna collect some data. So let's go ahead and collect some observations, some data. Uh, what do you know here? Well, um, I know that if we're at zero um, degrees Celsius, do you know what the Kelvin temperature is? If we're at zero degrees Celsius, the Kelvin temperature is 273 Kelvin. Exactly. That's exact. And if we're at 100 degrees Celsius, do you know what the Kelvin temperature is? 373. 373 Kelvin. So we can do the same thing. This is also a linear relationship. We'll plot Kelvin here, and then we'll plot degrees Celsius here. The first data point is zero and 273. So we'll have this at zero, and then we're gonna start the y-axis at 273. So our first data point's here. And our second data point is at 100 degrees Celsius. So this is 100. And then um, we're gonna be at 373 Kelvin. So this is at 373 Kelvin here. And that's our second data point. And then we, we need more data to assume. It might be a curve, but we already know that this is a straight line relationship. It's linear. Well, if it's straight line, then that's y equals mx plus b. Okay, so what is y? y is the Kelvin temperature. What is m? m is the slope. So the slope is delta y, 373 minus 273, over, which is 100 over delta x. Delta x is 100 minus zero, which is 100. So this is 100 over 100. 100 over 100 is one, 100 Kelvin per 100 Celsius. So this is gonna be the temperature, temperature in Kelvin or the temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, and then uh, x is temperature in degrees Celsius. And then the intercept is 273. So we get this familiar equation. This familiar equation is that Kelvin is equal to degrees C plus 273. This is called a, um, what, what is this equation called? Is it called, uh, well, you know, this, this equation holds, this, this could be the law, you know. Um, this, is, this is what we call an empirical equation. Empirical equation just comes from observation. And so we've seen this graphing stuff already. And graphing is important, but this is algebra, so I'm gonna skip it. Skip that, skip that. It's important to know slopes. You should be able to do this kind of stuff. All right, let's take a look at number 95. That might be more. If not, you should um, review this graphing stuff because it's important. So the amount of heat, Q, remember Q is the symbol for heat. Absorbed when a pure substance melts is proportional to the mass of the sample. 
express this proportionality in mathematical form, change it into an equation using the symbol delta H of fusion for the proportionality constant. What the heck are they talking about? The constant of the heat of fusion for pure substance. If heat is measured in calories, what are the units of the heat of fusion? Write a word definition for the heat of fusion. Um, so basically, all they're, all they're saying is that um, there's a ratio between heat and amount, you know. And so this ratio is Q over M. This is the amount of heat of the mass. So if you have twice as many grams, you're going to need twice as much heat. Three times as many grams, you'll need three times as much heat. There. And they're saying to call that delta H of fusion. Delta H of fusion, this is the heat, and we call this the heat of fusion. Delta H is um, enthalpy. We haven't talked about that, but that's also heat. This is called heat of fusion. Fusion means melting. This is a fancy word for melting. So if we want to melt something, it depends on how many grams. If you have 100 grams of ice, you're going to need a certain amount of heat to melt that. If you, if you have 200 grams of, of ice, you're going to need twice as much heat to melt it. So let me see what they did. No, well, this is a C. You know, you don't want to think about this too much. You could look up the definition and that type of stuff, but it's not so significant because we're going to come back to these types of calculations in great detail later. So we'll get back over here and we'll take a look here. They're saying um, the amount of heat is proportional to the uh, to the mass, the amount. Here they wrote it a little differently. You know, they uh, multiply both sides by M to get this equation here. Fusion is melting. Okay, we'll just move on. It takes 7.39 kilocalories to melt 92 grams of ice. Oh, there we go. Now we have some actual numbers. So this is the ratio we can get for the heat of fusion here. The ratio that we can get is we know 7.39 kilocalories. Kilocalories is abbreviated to kcal. That's the unit of heat. 7.39 kilocalories per 92 grams. Now, this is a chemical calorie. You know, when we're thinking about calories from food, um, it's different. It's a different unit. Calories from food has a capital C. Chemical calories has a little c. And it turns out in one food calorie, there's a thousand chemical calories. And so this is why when you say, okay, I had a thousand calories for lunch, you actually didn't, you had a million chemical calories for lunch, but you, people don't want to say kilocalories. I had a thousand kilocalories for lunch. It's a hassle to say. So they de developed a new unit, the capital C calorie. Calculate the heat of fusion of water. So what they mean is per gram. Um, when they say calculate, they, they don't want it per 92 grams. They want it per one gram. So all, all we have to do is we do this. We take 7.39 and divide it by 92. And then we're going to get this. Um, it's going to come out to 0 0.0803. How many sig figs am I allowed? Looks like two, but let's go with three here. Um, or maybe three, two kilocalories per one gram. Let me do that per one gram. This is ice. So this is a gram of ice. We should be more specific as we get more advanced. We should be more. This isn't good for everything. It's only good for ice. If we want to melt gold, it's going to take a lot more heat probably to melt gold than ice. That's for sure. Kilocalories is not a convenient unit for this. And so calories is better. Calories is smaller, so we got to make the number bigger. And so that would be, um, move it three over. So it'd be 80.32 calories per gram. And we're actually, we're only allowed two sig figs, sorry. This is going to be 80 calories per gram of ice. Again, I got to watch out myself, make sure I do that. And so let's do this, see what they did here. Yeah, something like something similar to what we did. Although they used a conversion, I just moved the decimal three over. I know calories are smaller, so I, this I got to make this number bigger. Kilocalories are bigger, so the number's smaller. 
Okay, let's move on. Time is at 50, okay. Well, um, let's see, when we ended the last break was 50, I think, so we'll start the next break now. Okay, let's go ahead and we're gonna break for another 15 minutes. Um, so go on break here. I'm going to pause the video. Damn. All right, any questions from the break? No. Clear drawings. So we're going to um, go down, maybe speed things up a little bit. Give a particular level explanation of why ice is less dense than water. Uh, well, the particular level is because of the structure. Let's see what they say, 3-26 has to do with the very open structure of ice. Let's see, can I wrote, can I? No, that's wrong. I don't know how I can get this to widen the window. But you saw, we saw in the simulations, the ice has a very open um, structure to it. And water is more compact. Uh, we, we already did this one in class. Calculate the density of benzene, so 166 grams per 180 milliliters. So this is mass over volume, 166 grams over 180 milliliters. <clears throat> Densities of gases are usually measured in grams per liter. You know, um, calculate the density of air. Okay, so it's 18.6 grams per 15.7 liters, so mass over volume, 1.18 grams per liter. If we did a grams per milliliter, we'd have to move it three over, you know, um, and so uh, it would be 0 0.00118, which is a, a bit um, of a hassle to say. So grams per liter is easier. Or <laughs> milligrams per milliliter would be easy as well. Ether, a well-known anesthetic, has a density of 0.736 grams per cubic centimeter. What is the volume of 471 grams of ether? And so. This, this is our conversion factor here. This converts in cubic centimeters to grams, or we invert it, and it converts grams into cubic centimeters. And so we can take a look at how they did it here. They converted grams into cubic centimeters by inverting it, the density here. That's three sig figs, three sig figs, they get three sig figs at the end. Um, determine the mass of 2.0 liters of rubbing alcohol as a density. And so here we got liters. So if we get in the milliliters of rubbing alcohol, then we can get grams because this would be, this is again, this density is only good for rubbing alcohol. It's not good for anything else. And so it's very specific to that. Um, <clears throat> okay, measurement, we did that. Um, the density here, we need the volumes. Um, we can calculate the volume. It's length times width times height. Um, here's the mass, the mass over the volume. I'm just going to do it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. When we do the volume, it looks like we're only allowed. You know, this is this is very unusual too. When I look at this, I automatically think the student made an error. Can you tell me why I think the student made an error in measurement of this wood? Where do you see the error? Maybe there's no error. <laughs> Maybe it's just easier. About, I, I don't know why they didn't use the same unit. So they should have just used millimeters. So 25.0 millimeters, 64.5 millimeters, and 3.1 millimeters. And then it's all consistent in the measurements. Um, the problem with doing this is some people will ignore the units and go ahead and multiply these three numbers, not realizing that the units are different. Okay, um, let's go to the next one. SI system includes metric units. Well, that's true, you know that. If two quantities are expressed in an equivalency, they are directly proportional to each other. Um, I think so. 
yeah, well, I guess that's this right. The scientific notation form of smaller number, uh, excuse me, of a number smaller than one has a positive, no, the, the number smaller than one is negative exponent, it's false. In changing a, a number in scientific notation whose coefficient is not between one and 10 to standard, um, yeah. So if the coefficient grows bigger, the exponent grows smaller. If the coefficient grows smaller, the exponent grows bigger, that kind of thing. So I think that's what they're saying here, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we can go through these just as a check. I want to go on though here. Here's a, a dimensional analysis problem or here standard. What are these dimensions in centimeters? Okay, so this this might be a more challenging problem here. Eight and a half inches. Well, actually, maybe it's not so challenging. This is eight inches to centimeters. This is one step. But this half, we have to convert that into decimal form. Well, that's easy. We could convert that into decimal form in our head. It's 8.5. Sometimes it's not so easy. Let's say it's eight and uh, eight and a half is 8.5 inches. But let's say it was eight and uh, three, three eighths. And then we got to convert the three eighths into decimal form and then add it. Or let's say it's even more confusing, 3.2 eighths, you know, we do that. We did something like that yesterday. The density of aluminum is 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. So the aluminum is about three times heavier than water for a given amount. An ecology-minded student has gathered 126 empty aluminum cans for recycling. So we have 126 cans. If there are 21 counts per pound, how many cubic centimeters and grams of aluminum does a student have? So we, we can go from 126 cans. These are aluminum cans. So this is actually three things, the quantity, aluminum, and cans here. And then we can try to cancel out. We can try to cancel out aluminum, or we could try to cancel out cans, or we can try to cancel out aluminum cans. Uh, <clears throat> it looks like here, there are 21 cans per pound. Well, these got to be aluminum cans. So we'll just cancel out the um, cans here, 21 cans per pound. And so that leaves us with pounds of aluminum. And then we can go from pounds of aluminum here to grams of aluminum maybe because I see some grams of aluminum up here. So we know that this one works for everything, 453.6 grams per pound. So now we have grams of aluminum. And if we have grams of aluminum, this is it here. We have 2.7 grams of aluminum for every cubic centimeter. So if we stop here, we can get, um, what, is, what are they asking for? Um, they're 21, how many cubic centimeters of, and grams of aluminum? If, if they're asking for grams of aluminum, we stop here. If they're asking for cubic centimeters of aluminum, we add one more step here. So let's take a look at what they did here. So th they um, did this. They stopped here, calculated the grams, 2.7 times 10 to the third grams, and then they added one more step to get the cubic centimeters of aluminum. You have to be careful because you don't want to round here. You know, if you round here, then you're going to compound the rounding here. So to avoid rounding here, you keep all the digits in your calculator, and then you do the final step here, and then round here. Okay. That's what you do. Or you just redo the calculation all, all from the beginning. Okay, let's um, take a look at the next. I miss this. Oh, no, I already did the, most of those. Okay, now we're on the more challenging problems, I think. Let's say skip a page, let's skip a page. No. Okay, so the more challenging problems here. Um, actually, we did this one, 119, we did that in class. 120, a woman has given birth to a bouncing six pound, seven ounce boy. How should she describe the weight? Um, in metric units, well, in metric units are going to be uh, kilograms, but this is a composite number here, but it's six pounds plus seven ounces. It's not six pounds times seven ounces. And so it's a little bit different than um, some of the others, but this is similar to what we've been doing before. So we need this either in all ounces or all pounds. Well, uh, pounds is more familiar, so let's go all pounds. And um, and so let's just do that really quick here. Uh, if I have six pounds 
and seven ounces. I want to convert ounces into pounds. So that's going to equal six pounds and, okay, seven ounces. I'm going to use dimensional analysis. I know that there are 16 ounces in a pound. And so this is going to be six pounds and, well, um, seven divided by 16. It's going to give me seven divided by 16. It's going to give me um, seven sixteenths, which is 0 0.4375. 0 0.4375. Okay, I'm not allowed this many sig figs. I'm only allowed one sig fig, but I'm going to carry it. I'm going to carry it because of, um, I'm not done with the calculation. And so this is going to be 6.4375 pounds is the weight of that baby. Okay, I'm not done because this is an intermediate answer. And then I need to convert that into metric units, which would be grams or kilograms. So let's go with, um, I don't know what babies are weighed, probably in grams, I would think. And so let's go 453.6 um, grams per pound. And so the pounds cancel out here. I'll just do pound to gram conversion. So I'm gonna go 0.4375 plus six equals, oh shoot, times 453.6, and so I get that, 2,920 grams. If it's 2,920, 2,920.05 grams, then I probably want to go kilograms, which would be 2.92 kilograms. We'll move it through decimal three over. Um, so let's see what we got here. Or we use the conversion factor. We could use the conversion factor, we just multiply it. You know, uh, they, just, they just move the decimal here. They, they didn't, this, look at what they did. They did an intermediate rounding. Intermediate rounding. I don't like that. I'd like to do one rounding step at the end. In fact, this is not considered Standard practice. Standard practice is carry the digits, round at the end. Okay, let's see what's next. How many grams of milk are in 12.0 fluid ounces? Now, the fluid ounce is different than a, a, a mass ounce or weight ounce. <laughs> So let's say the, it's filled to the brim. And so how many grams of milk? We gotta assume that the milk is completely filling this glass. And so this, this is where we have to start being careful about units. You know, we're in the challenging problems. When you're in the challenging problems, you, you gotta worry about making sure you label things correctly. So we have 12.0 fluid ounce of milk. And we want to know how many grams of milk that is. So ultimately, we want grams of milk. But how am I going to get there? I don't know how I'm going to get there. I'm just going to try to figure out some path to get there. So here I have different choices. I can get rid of fluid ounces, or I could get rid of fluid ounces of milk, or I could try to get rid of milk. Let's see what else we have here. The density of milk is 64.4 pounds per cubic foot. There are 7.48. I don't like this. Here, we don't need that. We could do this using exact. We need this. I don't know what the density is. This one, we don't need this. Gallons to cubic feet, we don't need that because we should be able to do this without that using conversion factors that we know. And so I'm going to go 12 fluid ounces. Um, do you know how many, okay, then there are four quarts. Do you know how many ounces are in a quart? Fluid ounces are in a quart? Actually, I don't but I do know how many are in a cup. Do you know how many fluid ounces are in a cup or a pint? Probably most people know a pint. Do you know how many fluid ounces are in a pint? A pint is two cups. Yeah, 16. Good. So we know that there are exactly 16 fluid ounces of anything in a pint. Do you know how many pints are in a quart? Uh, 
Is it four pints in a quart or two pints? Um, it's actually two pints. There are two pints in a quart. There's four, four pints in a, um, okay, yeah, that's fine. And then, um, okay, fluid ounces cancel. So that gives us pints of milk, pints of milk cancel, that gives us quarts of milk. And then from quarts of milk, we can go to gallons. They don't need to give us this too. We, we already know that. We should know that. In one gallon, there are four quarts. I wouldn't give this to you because I would assume everybody knows that there are four quarts in a gallon exactly. Okay, where are we going from here? Gallons, cubic feet. How do I get from, yeah. I have a volume in gallons, but how can I get the volume in cubic feet? Now that's gonna be tricky. How am I gonna do that? And so I have to think, well, I can go from, um, what do I know about gallons? Well, I could go from gallons to quarts, but that would be going backwards. I can go from gallons to liters. So let's just try that, 0.57 uh, liters. And then from liters, I wanna get closer to cubic feet but uh, I don't know. Let's go liters to milliliters. And now this is getting closer because I can go from milliliters to cubic centimeters. So let me do some erasing here. And so maybe I'm getting closer here. So if I'm at milliliters, I'm gonna go from milliliters to cubic centimeters um, because we know that there's exactly one cubic centimeter and exactly one milliliter, they're the same thing. Okay, now this is getting closer because the cubic centimeter is length cubed, foot is cubed. And so I know the relationship between centimeters and inches. Relationship between centimeters and inches is that there are 2.54 centimeters per one inch. But the problem with this conversion factor is it's not centimeters cubed. I need centimeters cubed. And so I can't just put a centimeters cubed and an inch cubed here. I have to cube everything inside there. And so that means it's one cubed, inches cubed, 2.54 cubed, which is about 16 centimeters cubed. And so everything has to be cubed inside there. And then I know the relationship between inches and, and feet, they're 12 inches in one foot, but this is a linear relationship. I need the cubic, so I have to cube the whole thing there. And so let's see how the units work out here, or the dimensions work out. And so when I look at the dimensions, the fluid ounces cancel, the fluid ounces leaves me with pints, the pints cancel, the quarts cancel, the gallons cancel, the liters cancel, milliliters cancel, cubic centimeters cancels because I'll have a centimeter cubed. Centimeter cubed is cubic centimeter that cancels and then cubic inches cancel, inches cubed, inches cubed here, and that leaves me with foot cubed or cubic feet. Now, how am I gonna punch this in the calculator? So why don't you try punching this in the calculator with me and see if you get the same answer. Um, this is the way I'd punch it into my calculator here. I'm gonna do um, 12 divided by 16 divided by two divided by four times 3.75 times 1,000 divided by 2.54. I'm gonna do 2.54 raised to the third. And here, if I keep punching in my calculator, unless I add parentheses, which I don't wanna add parentheses, I'm gonna hit the equal sign now. So I got equals. And then divided by 12 cubed, and then hit equals again. And um, this comes out to 0 0.01253 cubic feet of milk. Um, um, oh, this is not 120, this is 12.0, 12.0. This number here. All right, let's see what they got. I like this. Why do I like this? Um, I'll, I'll, oops, let me show you. Come on. 
I don't like this conversion factor. Um, this conversion factor, number one, nobody has this one memorized. So reason number one, I dislike this. Nobody has this one memorized. Number two, this conversion factor is only good to three sig figs. We avoided this. We were going from gallons to feet. So let's go from gallons to cubic feet. This is exact. This is four sig figs. This is exact, 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 exact. So we got it to four sig figs, which is better than three sig figs. In this case, we're given three sig figs. So, you know, ideally we want four sig figs. And so um, if you take, if you take these conversion factors from gallon to cubic feet, and multiply them all together, we get this, and then round it to three sig figs, we get this number here. Let's see what the book did. So they went from fluid ounces to quarts. Oh, here they use 32 fluid ounces in a quart or 64 fluid ounces in a gallon. You might have, you know, those are perfectly fine and all those are exact. Or eight fluid ounces in a cup. You know, we could use any of those and then just um, convert it, get it to gallons. Once we get it to gallons, then they're using this one big one here. What are they asking for grams? Oops, sorry. I screwed it up. I didn't quite finish it here. They're asking for uh, grams of milk. Now I know why I wanted to go to cubic feet. I wanted to go to cubic feet because of the density here, 64.4 pounds per cubic feet. So I needed to add some more conversion factors here. And so what are the other conversion factors? I got to go from cubic feet to pounds. And so I would multiply 64.4 pounds of milk per one cubic foot of milk. And so this gives me pounds of milk, but they don't want pounds, so I need to convert it to grams. So 453.6 grams in a pound of anything. So I needed two more conversion factors there. Now, this is weird um, here. You can tell them when they're multiple authors because um, if they're multiple authors, um, people have their own way of doing things. And here I can tell because remember how many sig figs they used for this before? In all the other calculations, they use five sig figs for this. If you remember what they used before, they used 453.59 grams per pound. They used that. And I said, no, I don't want to memorize that. I'd rather memorize 453.6 grams per pound. Now they're, they're doing 454. I don't, I don't like to memorize too many. How many of these do you want to memorize? So I only memorize one. I don't memorize 454. I don't memorize 453.9. I just memorize 453.6 if I'm going to memorize it. You know, sometimes you don't have to memorize it, but this is such a common conversion. It's probably a good idea to memorize it anyway. So uh, that's a thing I, I dislike about this book. They're inconsistent, that's one. And number two, they don't show me the rounding step. You know, I wanna see that rounding step here. So I left all the digits in my calculator and so I'm just gonna do the two last ones. If I cleared it and rounded there, that would be an intermediate rounding step, which I don't wanna do. Times 64.4 times 453.6. It gives me 366.05. So this is 366.05 grams. Then we can round it to 366, which is fine. Let me clear these. A welcome rainfall caused the temperature to drop by 33 degrees Fahrenheit after a sweltering day in Chicago. What is this temperature drop in degrees Celsius? Now this is a delta T, not a T. And so we don't have to worry about the offset there. We just have to compare the size of the, of the degree. And so we don't use that algebraic equation. We use the conversion factor. The conversion factor is that there are 180 Fahrenheit's for every 100 Celsius. In other words, for every five Celsius, there's nine Fahrenheit. 
or for every one Celsius, there's 1.8 Fahrenheit. And so you see the offset here, the plus 32 doesn't show up or the minus 32 doesn't show up because we're, not cal we're calculating a temperature drop, a change, a temperature drop or a temperature increase, we're just looking at it like this. If you plug this into our regular equation, you know, 33 degrees Fahrenheit is gonna be close to freezing, you know, close to zero degrees C. And so make sure it's clear to you, that kind of stuff. A recipe calls for a quarter cup of butter. Calculate its mass in grams if its density is 0.86. So here we're given the density and we've got a quarter cup. So if we've got a quarter cup, we, um, we go from, <clears throat> There are four, four cups and a quart. So we shouldn't need to be given this, you know. Or four cups and a quart. And so we could see what they did. So they, they have a quarter cup and we could use four cups and a quart or, and then four quarts in a gallon. And then 3.75 liters per gallon, milliliters. And then what is this coming from? Oh, this is a milliliter is the same thing as a cubic centimeter. And then they have our density here, 0.86 grams of butter. So this is a little less dense than water. Butter should float on water per cubic centimeter. And they get 51 grams. In active example 3-29, you calculated that you would have to work six weeks to earn enough money to buy a $1,800 $82.49 television. Uh, you would be working five shifts of four hours each at $9.25 an hour, but alas, when you received your first paycheck, you found that exactly 23% of your earnings had been withheld for Social Security, federal, and state income tax and workers' compensation insurance. Taking these into account, how many weeks will it take you to earn $1,082.49? Let's look at active example 3D. There's 29. Suppose you have just landed a part-time job. It pays $9.25 an hour. You work five shifts each week and the shifts are four hours long. You plan to save all your earnings to pay cash for a 50 inch 1080p plas smart plasma HD TV that costs 1082.49 tax included. You're paid weekly. How many weeks must you work in order to save enough money to buy the television? You might also be interested in knowing how much cash you'll have left for uh, video games or other goodies. Develop. I don't develop a plan. I just start. What will be your total pay at by the end of the six weeks? So th this is a, just an example of dimensional analysis type problem here. Um, 1082.49 is what our, um, our given is. That's how much money we need to make. And so let's go ahead and do that here. All right. Um, 1082.49 dollars. And then we want to cancel out dollars. So how can we cancel out dollars? Oh, here, we got $9.25 per hour. Um, any others? No. And so here, we're going to have $9.25. So the dollars cancel per hour, one hour. And so this is going to tell us how many hours we have to work um, to earn that much. Um, and then we got to cancel out hours. So let's see, we could go with hours to minutes, but let's see if we have something else here. Oh, we have something else here, four hours long. What's four hours long? Shifts. So that might be more relevant here. Four hours per shift, one shift. And so this tells us how many shifts we have to work. And then um, let's try to get rid of shifts. Um, can we get rid of, you work five shifts per week. So there are five shifts per week. And so we can get rid of shifts here. Now we have weeks. This is how many weeks you got to work. Well, that's what we want. We're paid weekly. And so um, how many weeks is that? So it's going to be 1082.49 divided by 9.25 divided by four divided by five not to 5.85 weeks. Um, but we're paid weekly and therefore um, we're going to work six weeks. 
six weeks. It would take to accumulate that much money. All right, that's the active example that they had earlier. Now, what do we have to do in this problem? Um, what we have to do in this problem is we have to um, compensate for that because we, we don't get all this. Um, this is our gross pay. And what happens to your gross pay is you're gonna get um, withholdings, tax withholdings. And it looks like there's 23% here withholdings. And so, um, so this is a complicated problem. Both of these are all, it's all dollars, but we have to be a little bit more careful in it. And so what does 23% mean? Um, this is what 23% means. Let me clear all this here. A second. What 23% means is percent is what we call part per hundred. So there's 23 out of 100. Now it's our job to figure out 23 what out of 100 what. And so 23% of our earnings had been withheld. Okay, so that means $23 are withheld for every $100 that you gross. Okay, what this means is that we're gonna lose 23 out of every $100 that you earn in withholdings. So that, what, what that means is that we're only gonna have $77, what we call $77 net income for every $100 gross income because $23 is gonna be withheld gross. Okay, so this is what I mean by composite unit here. Both of these are dollars, but we have to put some descriptors on here in order to understand that. Now, when you buy a television, you can't buy these using gross dollars. You have to buy the television using net dollars because these $23 disappear. That's where um, uh, that's gonna go. And so this 1082.49, we're gonna have to label that. Is that gross dollars or is that net dollars? No, we need 1082 after tax dollars. And so this is 1082.49 net dollars. Okay, then, then we can get rid of dollars or we could get rid of net dollars or we could just get rid of net. Well, it looks like we could get rid of net dollars here, net dollars here, because there are 77 net dollars for every 100 gross dollars. So you have to earn $100 gross to net $77 here. So that means we need more money to buy this television. How much gross dollars do we need to, for the, that TV? So it's 1082.49 times 100 divided by 77. So what it means is we really need 1,400. We have to earn $1,405.83 in order to have enough take home income to pay for this television. And so we need to earn that much. So this is, well, that's an intermediate answer. So that's $100 gross. And then I know I get 925 gross dollars, 925 gross dollars pre-tax for every hour you work. And so the gross cancels and that um, gives us the uh, hours. The net cancels, net dollars, the gross dollars cancel, we're left with hours and then we know that we have four hours per shift. Yeah, four hours per shift. And then how many shifts? Five shifts per week. So how many weeks is that? So I'll do that divided by 9.25 divided by four divided by five, 7.59, nine weeks. In other words, this is gonna be eight weeks. This person is gonna to have to work eight weeks in order to, not what we calculated earlier. Um, they're gonna to have to work eight weeks. Yeah. They're gonna have money left over because um, 
they only need really they only need to work 7.6 weeks and so they're going to work four tenths of a week extra so they're going to have some money left over how much money left over are they going to have well we do um we do this uh, we just put in eight weeks we just work backwards eight weeks um we can do that over here working backwards we could take eight weeks times you know five shifts per week times four hours per shift times 925 an hour and so if they work the full eight weeks and so i'll just do eight times five there are different ways we could do this calculation times four times 9.25 they're going to earn fourteen hundred eighty dollars Fourteen hundred and eighty dollars zero zero and so they're gonna have a little bit left over they're gonna have about seventy five seventy four dollars left over here um, left over although this is this is gross dollars we can go to net dollars actually to go let's not do let's not do um, gross dollars let's go to net and so this is nine twenty five gross dollars right and so we have to write gross here times okay here that's going to yield 77 net dollars oh, sorry this is probably getting per hundred dollars gross so i'm going to take that 1480 times 77 divided by 100 and that's going to give them 1139 so this is comes out to 1139.60 net dollars that's what they're going to earn they're going to spend 1082.49 on the television minus 1082.49 on the tv and that means they're going to have 57 dollars and 11 cents left over of net and so 57 11 net um, left over to spend on whatever accessories they want uh, the gross it doesn't make sense because then we'd have to deduct the taxes from the gross so that's why i crossed out this 1480 and this is why it's very dangerous in advanced problems it's very dangerous in advanced problems because if you don't write net and you don't write gross then you have no idea what you're doing or it's impossible to solve you're just taking guesses okay so um, let's do another problem here. Th this is, I'm spending, actually I'm getting behind, but I'm spending a lot of time on dimensional analysis because like I said before, dimensional analysis is the number one um, problem solving method that we use. And so we went through all of chapter three, at least the blue problems, all the chapter three blue problems. Um, this is the end, this is the last problem. And so I, I want something more challenging. And so let's go to something a little bit more challenging here. And so we're going to look at the next level book. The next level book is Chem 1A. And um, uh, chapter three, let's see where I put chapter three. This is from chapter one of Chem 1A. Chapter one of Chem 1A. So right after you finish Chem 4, you're gonna be hit with problems like this. And so let's see if we can do this. This is a chapter one, first week type problem, Chem 1A. The volume of seawater on Earth is about 330 million cubic miles. If seawater is 3.5% sodium chloride by mass and has a density of 1.03 grams per milliliter, what is the approximate mass of sodium chloride in tons dissolved in the seawater? So we want to figure out how many tons of seawater is, in, I mean, how many tons of sodium chloride is in seawater. This is all ocean water here. Okay, so what are we given? We're given the volume of the ocean water. Let's go ahead and write that in here. I have no strategy and I'm not gonna think, I'm not gonna waste any time thinking of a strategy. I'm just going to 
just pick a path and go down it and uh, I don't care if it's the wrong path. You know. If I was more familiar, you know, like I said, if I was more familiar with the jungle, then I'd know which path to go on. But, you know, how do you get familiar with the jungle? Do you just study one tree in the jungle and leave it at that? No, you got to get a better feel for the breadth of the jungle. But anyway, um, so we got three, uh, 330 million cubic miles, but this is a chem, this is a beginner chemistry mistake. Or this is, you know, this is cubic miles of sea water. So you know, this would be an advanced chemistry student would obviously put the seawater there. All right, now 3.5%, so that's a percentage, is 3.5 out of 100. So we got to figure out what that is. And so we ended up with this yesterday, I think. And so 3.5 parts, okay, it's by mass. And so what we're going to say is 3.5 grams out of 100 grams because it's by mass. And grams is the most common unit we use for mass. So we'll just pick it. It doesn't matter. We could pick pounds too. 3.5 pounds out of 100 pounds. doesn't matter. You know. But grams is most convenient. So let's do that. Now, what is it? 3.5 grams of what per 100 grams? So it says 3.5% sodium chloride. So that means 3.5 grams of sodium chloride. Sodium chloride has the formula NaCl. And this is in seawater. So for every 100 grams of seawater, there is three and a half grams of salt <coughs> dissolved in that. And so it's uh, three and a half grams of salt and uh, 96 and a half grams of other stuff. Okay, what is this one here? This is the density. Now, a beginner student would leave it like this. An advanced student would go, that's 1.3 grams of what? And so, um, well, they're saying seawater and has a density. So this is seawater. So this is 1.03 grams of seawater per milliliter, one milliliter of seawater. And so the density is, if I have a milliliter of seawater, how much does it weigh? It weighs 1.03 grams. So it's a little bit more dense than, than pure water. Pure water, it's because of the salts dissolved in there. It's going to make it way heavier. Um, what else do they give us? They give us one ton is equal to 2,000 pounds. This is generic. This works for anything. So one ton is 2,000 pounds. And that's it. So these are the things I have to work with plus whatever else I have. So what I need to do is I need to get rid of um, miles cubed. I'd like to get rid of miles cubed, but I don't know anything with miles cubed. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to cube the whole thing to get rid of miles cubed or miles cubed of seawater or whatever. Do I have anything with miles cubed of seawater? No, I don't, but I have something with milliliters of seawater. So, so I'm going to go miles to feet. Well, I know that. There's exactly 5,280 feet per one mile. And so what happens here is the cubic miles cancel and leave me with cubic feet. So I have cubic feet of seawater. Well, that's okay because I know eventually I can get from feet to inches to centimeters. Now I have some kind of strategy. I'm going to go from cubic feet to cubic um, inches to cubic centimeters. Cubic centimeters is the same thing as a milliliter. So I'm gonna go with that. So I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna go, um, one foot is 12 inches. And since I'm dealing with cubic feet, I have to cube this whole thing. Like that. And so now I have cubic inches. Well, from cubic inches, it's easy to go to cubic centimeters because they're 2.54 centimeters exactly in one inch but I need to cube that whole thing. Okay, so what's happening here is the cubic feet cancel, the cubic inches cancel, and that leaves me with centimeters cubed. Centimeters cubed, well, that's the same thing as a milliliter. And so I know that uh, there's one milliliter is equivalent to one cubic centimeter. Here, I don't cube the whole thing, as a cubic milliliter is meaningless. And so this, I don't need to cube this one here because this is already correct. And so now the cubic centimeter cancels out the cubic centimeters. I'm good with milliliters. Now I have milliliters of seawater. If I have milliliters of seawater, 
then I can get rid of that whole thing right here. One milliliter of seawater weighs 1.03 grams. So 1.03 grams of seawater here. Like that. And so milliliters of seawater, cancel milliliters here, seawater there. And that leaves me with grams of seawater. What are, what are we after here? They don't want grams of seawater. They want um, grams of sodium chloride, or they don't want grams, they want tons. But here I have grams of seawater up here. I can get rid of that here by using this. 100 grams of seawater for, contains 3.5 grams of sodium chloride. And so the grams of seawater cancel and that leaves me with grams of pure sodium chloride or grams of salt. Do they want grams of salt in tons? No, they don't want grams, they want tons. Well, here, I can go pounds to tons. So I'm gonna go grams to pounds. One pound is equivalent to 453.6 grams. So the grams cancel, that leaves me with pounds of sodium chloride. And then the final, conversion would be getting rid of pounds here and converting that to tons. So one ton is equivalent to 2,000 pounds. The pounds cancel. That leaves me with tons of sodium chloride. And so how many tons of sodium chloride do I have? And so let's do the calculation here. I'm gonna punch this out in my calculator. Uh, why don't you do the same thing? And so I'm gonna do 330 million one, two, three, one, two, three. Did I do that right? 330 million, yeah. Or write it in scientific notation. Times 5280. 5280, I'm gonna raise that to the third, the 5280 cubed, and then hit equals so I don't have to deal with parentheses. Times 12 cubed equals times 2.54 cubed equals times 1.03 times 3.5 divided by 100, divided by 453.6, divided by 2,000 equals. And so I'm gonna get 5.465, 5.465 times 10 to the 16. Wow, that's huge. 5.4, five and a half times 10 to the 16 tons of sodium chloride. That's an enormous number. Maybe I made an error, and uh, we should check if I made an error. So um, the way we check it is we'll just double check the calculation by redoing the calculation. 330, one, two, three, one, two, three. 330 million times 5280 cubed equals times 12 cubed equals times 2.54 cubed equals times 1.03 times 3.5 divided by 100 divided by 453.6 divided by 2,000. Yeah, it's a huge number, but obviously there's gonna be a huge number of salt in the ocean. This is all, the entire world's oceans here. Okay, is that what you guys got? Okay, yeah, um, Priscilla has that right. Um, that comes from the percentage. Percentage is always out of 100, you know, parts out of 100. So that came from here. This guy here. That came from here. This guy here. Okay, yeah, how many sig figs do we have? Well, this, I don't know. I, I'd call that probably two sig figs. Two sig figs. This is infinite, that's exact, it's infinite, it's infinite, it's infinite. This is how many sig figs? 1.03 grams per milliliter. This is three sig figs, good. This is, the density is only two sig figs. This is four sig figs, you're right. This is infinite. 
So it looks like we're only allowed two sig figs. So rounding this to two sig figs, we get five and a half times 10 to the 16 tons of an ACL. Okay. All right, well, I guess it's time for our next break. So, um, but uh, the next thing I want you guys to do is uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna try this. I haven't done this before, but I wanna do a Zoom subgroups. Let me see if I can do that. Um, yeah, there's a way I can do this. So the next problem I'm going to have you guys work on as a group, the next problem is going to be um, something you'll try to um, do as a group. And we'll break up. If, if there's, um, if you have friends in the class you'd like to be grouped with, that's, that's fine. Do that. I got to figure out how to do this group. So think about that. We're going to do one more problem and then we're going to call it for chapter three and move on to chapter four. Okay, so I'm going to um, stop the recording here. See, 259.3. Yeah, maybe I'll just stop the recording. <laughs>